Okay, so the Mediterranean, 1940 to 1942. This should be your fourth stop as a solo play. And I would suggest, while I don't realistically think anybody's going to play through the entire scenario turn by turn, it's quite lengthy. I don't think you should try playing it against a human being until you've played through at least a chunk of it on your own and got a sense of what's going on. And we're here at the very beginning, looking at the initial Italian mobilisation. You get two garrison units, which you can set up anywhere you like to support what you already have in North Africa. So an infantry unit at the Tobruk Fort, um, a garrison unit and a convoy and fleet at Tripoli. But you can also set them back up in Italy itself. I, before I start talking about that and the specifics of this, um, of this scenario, I wanted to spend a few moments sort of waxing lyrically on the philosophy of how you get better at board games. And this is something that I think happens in essentially four overlapping stages. The first stage of your improvement in a game is learning the rules. It's that simple. Somebody who knows the rules is better at a game than somebody who doesn't. If you don't know how the horsey moves in chess, you are in trouble. If you know all the intricacies of exactly when and when you can't castle through threats, the three-move rule, right, the various 30, 40, 50 move rules, stalemate, en passant, and that you in fact call it a knight and you can promote to a knight, then you are going to be a stronger player than somebody who just knows how to move the basic pieces. There are going to be occasions when knowing that rule will just make you better at game. So that's the first step in learning game is always learning the rules. And it's usually fairly short. Chess is the world, the earliest historical war game that we have any record of, uh, probably invented around the 5th, 6th century AD. And until modern board games were invented in 1903 by Elizabeth Maggie, it was the most complicated board game you could play. Uh, today, of course, it's actually quite a simple board game. Sort of simple, easy to medium Euros, uh, Carcassonne, uh, Puerto Rico, have bigger rule sets than, than chess. So that's your first step. It's always your first step, learning the rules. And then, immediately after it, there are two interlocking stages that come very close together. One of them is learning tactics, and the other is learning by rote. So let me explain what I mean by those two things. So tactics are small bits of knowledge about how to respond in a certain situation. Uh, this is how I would teach you Carcassonne if I was teaching you the basics of playing and how to be a better player. I'd begin by teaching you shares, steals, freebies, and th those three tactical plays. And those give you a way of responding in a specific situation that makes your play slightly better. They also, to some extent, deepen your understanding of the game. Rote learning is different. Rote learning is you simply memorise a particular sequence or set of information and that makes you a better player. But it doesn't deepen your understanding of the game, but it is an essential part of becoming a better player. Uh, so take Puerto Rico. If I was teaching you Puerto Rico at the beginning, and the first thing I would teach you would not be a tactic. The first thing I would teach you would be a rote learning, which is that the opening goes quarry, small market, mare. That's the choices in the opening. And those are the choices that the first, second and third player should make. And if the first player doesn't make the right choice, you simply select whichever one is highest up on that list, 
quarry, small market, mare, and you take that on your turn. It's effectively an opening strategy. It's the equivalent of chess's pawn to king four. It's something you just know is a sound opening strategy, and you don't really need to understand why to apply it. So those two things tend to come close together, and exactly which one dominates depends upon the game. But then, as you begin to develop tactics and learn stuff by rote, and you've begun to master the rules, you get into strategy. And strategy is a much larger thing. It's getting a grip on general concepts that hold the game together. So this is beginning to understand concepts like tempo in chess. It's beginning to understand why you generally prefer to share rather than to steal, even though you know both tactics in Carcassonne. It's understanding that Puerto Rico is fundamentally a money game and that early income is the key to late game victory points. So strategy, but strategy requires you to understand the rules. It requires you to have a certain amount of rote learning and tactics under your belt. And it builds on those to give you a deeper understanding of the game. Now, Hex and Counter War games are a little bit unusual uh, in two respects, and they come down to the size of the rule set. So unconditional surrender, let me just make this clear. Unconditional surrender is a medium complexity hex and counter war game. This is nowhere near the level of complexity that hex and counter war games get to. And I'm not even talking about obscure ones. Um, Starfleet Battles was an incredibly popular game when I was first getting into Hex and Counter War games. The rule book for Starfleet Battles is a tiny little type, and it's about six times the length of the rule book for Unconditional Surrender. So that's where you're going if you're thinking heavy games. But the rule book is just huge, and that means that you'll be learning rules a lot longer and the impact they're going to have on your play is going to be much larger. Um, if you don't know the stalemate rule in chess, that's going to cost you the occasional win. But that's all. If you don't know the naval supply interdiction rules in Unconditional Surrender, you are going to get absolutely destroyed every single time you try to play the Mediterranean scenario. Uh, in fact, this is the scenario that really hurts. I've, as well as playing it solo, I've now played against a couple of other human beings in order to prepare for this video. And there are two things that reinforced this to me. One was a player playing the British, started attacking, and then popped up in the chat after a few months to say, I can't believe how difficult I'm finding it to take Tobruk. And I kind of chatted back, well, you have to prep the attack before you go in. And he immediately responded, what do you mean prep the attack? And then I explained a bunch of stuff about how forts work. And he was like, oh my goodness, I didn't realise any of that. Right? It's always just fallen over when I've hit it before. And I was like, I, I, was like, I do not know how that can happen. I mean, it's a fortified position. So I was playing a second game where I was playing the British and my Ital I had an Italian opponent and the Western Desert Force advanced and I hit Brook and it fell over. And I realised that the Italian player had no idea how to mount a defence at the fort. And therefore, people who'd played against that person had never developed any idea of how to mount an attack because the two were just not playing with a knowledge of the rules that were involved. So this is the scenario where that rules knowledge will really hurt if you do not have it. I mean, it hurts everywhere in the game. Um, how much rules knowledge do you need? Well, if we're talking about Carcassonne 
or Puerto Rico, which are games I play fairly regularly, I would say that I have a absolutely sound rules knowledge. I have no real gain I can make by learning anything. I know all the rules. I know which optional rules exist. I know which rules are different on different implementations. Uh, I know what effects those rules have. And I can bring those to mind immediately and automatically, and I don't really need to think about it. I don't know unconditional surrender like that. Not only do I not know all of the rules, I can't bring them to mind immediately and instinctively. I have to think. I have to stop for a second and think, is my fleet in that port going to count as the weather zone for North Africa or the weather zone for the Mediterranean? And then I have to go and check that in the rule book and check that against the map. And sometimes what I have to do is load up a training version of the scenario and then play the move out to see whether or not it actually works. And that's the level at which I have known almost every hex war game I've ever played. I've never known a hex war game's set of rules in the kind of detail that I do for a lot of board games. And the reason is that I've never played a hex war game routinely against multiple opponents. I've played some miniature war games against a rotating set of opponents on a regular basis and even in a couple of tournaments. But miniature war games will generally play in a few hours. So you can take them to a club, you can play them at a club. Most hex encounter war games won't. You can't play um, a full unconditional surrender in under three hours. So you usually only get to play them when you've got an opponent who is a dedicated opponent. So I've played um, East Front, for example. I've played that quite a few times, but I've only played it against my father, which means, A, we have a mutual understanding of the rules, so we never really have to go into detail and check things, so we're probably playing some things wrong. We also have a much more limited tactical, strategic kind of response network. We're only responding to what the other person does. The other person is only responding to what we do. So my kind of grip on the rules is just not that good. And precisely because I only play it against a small number of people. Unconditional surrender with this arrangement on Board Game Arena. Yes, I know that Vassal exists. I've even used Vassal once or twice for things. Uh, I find it quite cumbersome. I don't find it really solves the problem. Uh, I would still end up, I think, mostly with like one, maybe two dedicated opponents who were willing to put the time in. But this implementation here on Board Game Arena completely changes things. I've got eight games running at the moment. And I think they're all against different opponents. I've got, I've started two main event games. I actually think I did that a bit too early. Um, I feel quite strongly I should have played through most of the scenarios I've just been suggesting you play through solo, that I should have played those through multiple times against human opponents before I started a main event game. But I'm playing like way more and I've got way more opponents than I would normally ever have for this sort of thing. And that's great. And it also means that I can go through that process of developing that really solid rules knowledge that I have for a lot of medium weight Euro games and really kind of deploy it here. And But here it's going to make so much difference. When I'm at the end of the curve, for really understanding the rules, I am going to have an enormous advantage over somebody who's in the early part or the middle part of the curve. An advantage that I don't have, an advantage that comes from tactics and rote learning and strategy when I'm playing Carcassonne, but here is going to come simply from, um, from knowing the rules. And none of that's a disparagement. I don't want any of that to sound like I'm saying, oh, Unconditional Surrender is a bad game because of that. Unconditional Surrender is the only Hex and Counter War game on Board Game Arena. It's a different game. It's designed to some extent around a different playing experience. My playing experience of only really having one opponent at a time 
for any particular Hex Encounter game isn't that unusual. Um, so that's going to be experience of a lot of players. But now suddenly the game's in a different environment and it's important to kind of accept that this game is just not designed in the same way that a game like chess is and what you get out of it won't be the same kind of thing that you get out of this. Uh, if anything, this rules learning experience is most similar to the card game Magic the Gathering, which I am hopelessly out of date with. I haven't played Magic seriously for what, 15 years now. Um, so, so I'm... And, and of course, Magic has a changing rule set so that literally it's built around this kind of rules learning bit of improving your skill being the main part of the game. Uh, and I would now be completely outclassed in any tournament because I just wouldn't know what most of the cards did. I would have to learn everything every time I picked up a card. So, yeah, it's in a lot of ways, it's it's most like Magic the Gathering. But yeah, I wanted to start this video off by kind of explaining that and just saying that, again, it's not a criticism. It is just the way Hex and Counter War games work. And it's something that you need to accept when you come into them. And it's something that you need to understand about them. Otherwise, you'll find them quite frustrating. And also, I think you'll probably not really understand why I'm saying Go and play what, about 60 or 70 turns solo, right? which is going to take you eight, nine hours before you even start. If you're interested, what I'm doing at the moment is I have a printed out copy of the rule book and I am reading it in the evening cover to cover right? and making notes as I go along. So I'm reading the whole rule book now that I've kind of got the basics down I really want to make sure I've got the rulebook unfortunately I'm not hugely impressed with the rulebook's kind of writing it feels like it's got some barkeries in it but it's okay to get through once you've actually played some games solo but yeah like I said let's head back to Mediterranean 1940 to 42 and do the Italian mobilization. When you mobilize, you click on a unit, then you click on the place that you're putting it. And there we are. Okay, I'm going to stop here and come back to this tomorrow. Transferring production points. Every scenario has this, and the main game has this, this ability for Germany to transfer production points to its allies, or for the UK to do the same. In this scenario, obviously you do it every single time, because you're not paying any cost from Germany in order to do so, so just confirm that. Uh, you can ignore the strategic combat in this scenario, it doesn't actually have any effect hold on to the submarines counter they will be useful uh, so just skip through that and now we come to the axes turn now i'm going to just skip straight through the axes and on to the allies the allies have three ground units available at the start of the scenario two garrisons and the western desert force during the scenario the british expeditionary force will become available as well which will give them a total of four ground units. At one point, the Western Desert Force has to go away in order to fight in Greece, and then it comes back. There are a lot of those little scenario-specific rules in here, such as the Italians having to send one of their convoys away for the invasion of Albania, um, the arrival of Rommel, etc. So I'm going to do a strategic movement, this is always worth remembering. If a unit is too far away to get involved in any of the actual fighting, then it might as well be strategic moved up. So in this case, four, five, six, seven, eight would only get the unit here. 
and that's far short of where it needs to be to be actively involved in anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the unit all the way out to here. Uh, that is an, a slightly odd feature of the strategic movement, uh, but it is a rule worth remembering. You can move anywhere along contiguous supply lines that doesn't pass through an enemy unit, an enemy city, or an enemy zone of control. And that means that units can actually advance well beyond their own front lines if there's a lack of enemy units protecting them. Uh, the most common situation in which this can get very weird is that the Germans during the invasion of the USSR can actually run units using strategic movement all the way up to the ports at Archangel and Murmansk at certain points. It's not actually worth doing, but it's very weird when it happens. Okay, so confirm. Now, take the Western Desert Force here. Uh, we'll skip over the Axis uh, phase as well, and we'll go straight to Supply. This is a game fundamentally about supply. Um, you're going to find that when you hit the supply all no convoy, you're always going to be left over with a certain number of troops you're going to have to manually supply. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Let's activate the Western Desert Force here. And send the Western Desert Force to Tobruk. Now, Tobruk is a fortress, and that's the first bit of walls we're going to concentrate on. So what I've done is I've hovered over the fort marker, and that has laid out all of the rules associated with forts. There aren't very many forts in the game. There's Tobruk in North Africa, which is Italian at the beginning of the game. It can switch to being British. It's the only fort that can do that. There's the Maginot Line in France, which will interfere with the initial invasion. There are Sevastopol and Leningrad and Moscow in the USSR. Um, so, basic things about forts. Let's start with the first and most important one. You have to attack them with an assault. So, even though this is fair weather in the desert, it's always fair weather in the desert... You cannot mobile attack the fort. So you have to declare an assault. And then you click on the assault marker to actually launch it. And uh, both the British and the Italians have one tank marker available. I'm going to spend the British tank marker. Oh, sorry. I have to conflict, confirm attack. And then I can spend the British tank marker. I'm not going to spend the Italian tank marker. And we get an attacker stopped result. That's quite a serious result. And you can see here we got a plus one for being UK. We got plus two for the tank. Minus one because obviously we're attacking into a city. Then we didn't roll very well. We got a four. And then this is the critical thing. The fort divides the roll by two. Okay, so let's talk about the actual attacking odds here. And go to the combat results table. If we brought up an air unit and threw it in, the Italians could counter that by throwing in their own tank marker. And we'd be looking at a 1 in 18 chance of getting a defender retreats. Here's the second combat feature of a fort. The defender can choose to ignore retreats. If they do, then their unit is depleted, takes a step loss instead of retreating. So obviously they can only do that with a full strength unit, which is an excellent reason never to put a garrison unit in a fort. This is the basic rules mistake that I think is most frequently made with the Tobruk fort, is to think that you can swap out the infantry unit, which is useful, for a garrison unit that you wouldn't otherwise be using, and the garrison unit will hold the fort just as well. It absolutely won't. The garrison unit takes a retreat result, it will be destroyed, and the fort will be lost. If the infantry unit takes a retreat result, it will take a step loss, and because you have to assault forts, 
the enemy won't get another opportunity to attack it, then in the replacements phase, you will simply rebuild the step loss. And because of that dividing by two, it doesn't really matter what you throw at the Tobruk Fort. If you isolate it, if you throw in two additional attackers, and if you get the defender on low supply, right, they're still going to be able to counteract the low supply with that uh, tank marker. And even if you're throwing in all of the other things, you're only looking at a pretty slim chance of getting a defender depleted result, which is the thing you would need to actually shift somebody out of a fort on a single attack, because that forces them down to a step loss, reduced state, and then they can't stand and take the step loss, so they're inevitably overrun. But you're only looking at a one in six chance of that with everything the British can possibly throw at it, and that's assuming that the Italians do nothing to interfere. So let's come back to the actual position. So again, fundamentally, this is a supply game. As long as the Tobruk fort is supplied, there is no way, no realistic way for the British to take it. So what the British need to do is cut off the Tobruk fort supplies. And for this, you're going to need additional units. So we bring up a unit to here. Now you're probably wondering, am I not worried that the Italian unit is going to come and attack the Western Desert Force, which no longer has a retreat space? I would love that to happen. If the unit in the fort launches an attack, then it has left the fort and it cannot re-enter the same fort on the same turn. So that would mean that even if it took out the Western Desert Force, it would still be outside the fort, and I would have a realistic chance of shifting it by throwing in tanks and air power and the garrisons. So I'd happily sacrifice the Western Desert Force for a shot at removing the Tobruk garrison. So we've moved everybody up to here. And it's worth saying a little bit about the other forces at the British disposal. Over in Gibraltar, there is a garrison and there is Force H, which is your aircraft carrier in the region. In Malta, there is also a garrison. Uh, Malta is also a fort. I forgot Malta is also a fort. So it's the... And... Then up at Plymouth, there's another convoy unit and there's a four sortie RAF. Um, I am going to show you some convoy actions. I don't necessarily think this is the best action you can take. So I'm going to send Force H up to Plymouth. Then I want to move that RAF fighter down to support my Western Desert forces. So I do naval transport, I assign an escort, confirm the escort, and then I begin moving the counter and I want it to come well, it's going to have to come to Port Said because there's obviously fleets already in Haifa and Alexandria. So I confirm the naval path. And the computer suddenly gets very slow and claims that I'm disconnected from the game server. It'll catch up with me in a moment. There it is. So when the unit gets to the C zone here, which I think is 22, uh, 19, C zone 19, it immediately comes in range of potential intercepting Italian units. Uh, so any time a naval unit is moving, with one or two small exceptions, it can be intercepted by any enemy unit that is in range. And so that includes 
naval units that are within two sea zones. So that would be First Fleet here in Tripoli is in sea zone 22, and sea zone 22 is adjacent to sea zone 19. And any fighter on a coastal hex in that sea zone, so the fighter aircraft in Palermo. So fighters have a shorter range than naval units for interception. And what we're going to do is commit First Fleet. And First Fleet, uh, the Italians get no bonuses. The British get lots of bonuses. They get plus two for being UK or US naval. And they get, in this case, it gets a plus two for being a carrier in fair weather. I'm going to spend the Axis submarine marker, apply a minus two to the result. Both sides get a sortie. Everything carries on. Now we can try and intercept with the aircraft. So this is the thing. In every sea zone, every enemy unit that is potentially within range can attempt to intercept. Every interception will add sorties to either the unit that's being attacked, the convoy, or to its escort. These stack up very fast. Okay, that did not go well for the Italian aircraft. But the Force H now has three sorties. Remember, it's going to gain a sortie when it lands at the other end. So we can now carry on. And our naval path is still in effect. Confirm naval path. Mm. And now you can see we've come in range of second fleet as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attack first of all with the weakened aircraft and the weakened fleet. I'm going to save second fleet for the third interception because by that stage hopefully Force H will be badly enough damaged that second fleet can overwhelm it. So again, the aircraft got an attacker stopped. They beat off the Italian fleet very easily as well. But Force H is now running at five sorties. And so it will be fighting at minus one, despite all those advantages being British, whereas we'll be fighting at even odds. Ah, but we still rolled really badly. Um, if we had won any of those interception battles then by getting a dr or better result then the intercepting unit would have been able to attack the convoy as well so we're still in range of both fleets but now we're out of range of the aircraft remember the aircraft can only strike in their own sea zone if you succeed in intercepting a convoy then the effect you have is it has to put in to the nearest friendly port so commit. And you'll see the escort has no sorties left on it. So now we're through to the convoy. Convoys fight as a minus two. They're much more vulnerable. And now we got DR plus two, which means we've successfully intercepted and we've cost the convoy two sorties. So what it's doing is it's calculating that Malta is actually our closest base and therefore requiring us to turn back to Malta. So that's not too bad. We're happy enough to get that. So the aircraft that... So we click on the convoy to say that we're no longer going to be activating it. Aircraft acquire sorties when they're being transported. Uh, the Force H has got six. And you will see that the convoy has three sorties. It took two sorties when it was attacked. That's how naval interception works. And there are a few exceptions. When you're carrying out an amphibious invasion, the enemy can only intercept with one unit. 
in each C zone that you pass through and you will get a bonus because of the surprise marker that's in place. It's harder to intercept an amphibious invasion than it is to intercept regular movement. Um, and now we pass, and I'll show you the next bit. So now we're looking at the supply box. So if we hit the supply all no convoy, you'll see it only removes one unit. We have five units to check with. And there's a whole variety of options. So I'm going to begin with those that don't have a listing next to them. If they don't have a listing next to them, it does not mean that they don't have supply options. It means that any supply option that's available to them passes through the potential of enemy interdiction. And therefore, the computer won't offer it to you as an automatic. We still want to supply everything. So we'll begin with the fighter. <laughs> You have to click use, you have to trace a thing to a port, to a convoy unit. Then you have to click use convoy. Then you have to indicate where you are going. So in this case, we're going to take the convoy to the Western Indian Ocean. And now the Axis player gets the opportunity to intercept. So we'll begin with the Italian fighter and the Italian fleet because they've got very little chance of successfully intercepting, but an Italian fleet with a minus three, if it was to hit a completely depleted convoy, that might well succeed in an interception. Okay. So we've wiped out all of the um, options, but that hasn't stopped the British unit from making its supply run. So we just click again. Uh, we're being offered the opportunity to intercept again. There really isn't very much point here. The convoy is exhausted and I have no idea why it's traveling in this direction. Uh, Sometimes the route finding for the naval units does some very odd things. Okay, what I'm going to do is send it to Plymouth instead, since it's going in this direction. Okay, so now Force H. Now Force H could be supplied through a convoy if we wanted to. It's also exhausted, and here's a special rule. If you are a fleet element and you go to get your own supply rather than getting it through a convoy, and you have six sorties, you may make as many attempts to do that as you wish. You can just carry on going to the location, getting um, until you succeed. Which means there is absolutely no point in trying to intercept the um, Force H here. We're not going to add sorties to it and we're not going to stop it from getting its supply. So what we'll actually do is we'll tick the no more interceptions for Force H here. Uh, Force H will still have to re-click. But there it is, it's sorted out. Now we have three units in the Western Desert which we can supply. And... In order to supply a unit, you must trace a ground line supply back to either a friendly home country city. So for the UK, that's things actually in the UK. Alexandria, Port Said, etc. Suez do not count as home countries and therefore we can't draw supply from them. Or draw a supply line to a convoy. And then the convoy has to draw a supply line back to one of the legal places it can go, which for the British does include the Western Indian Ocean box over here. So you can supply things through Sea Zone 31 and the Suez Canal. The other option we have available is you can take limited supply from a friendly 
uh, second power, it's capital, so or factory space. So in this case, from Cairo, Cairo would allow us to take uh, limited supply, and you can see it's making that offer to us, and also Jerusalem uh, up here. So if you hover over this thing, you can switch around what you want for the options, Cairo or Jerusalem. Uh, so there's enough overseas factories here to provide limited supply to four units. A unit on limited supply drops to a low supply level, but it stays at the low supply level. It never drops to no supply. Low supply is a useful way of keeping units that aren't in the front line just ticking over until they're ready to be used. The Italians will need to make a lot of use of this. The British less so. Uh, you'll notice that if fleet element doesn't have a possibility of interception, then the computer just automatically resupplies it without worrying. So the Mediterranean fleet is not actually required to do any supplying. We want these units here in full supply and available to be used next turn. So we're going to use the USS option on this side. But I want to draw attention to something that the computer does automatically, which doesn't matter for the invasion of Italy and Normandy where you're doing these big amphibious assaults because what you do is you simply work on the assumption that every convoy can supply two units and you just make sure there's loads of convoys there and you just keep pumping stuff through. What the computer tends to do is it tends to route everything through the same convoy until that convoy is exhausted. There's a little summary at the bottom. Second convoy's available, third convoy's available, and fourth convoy's available. But it's giving zero of the units to that, zero of the units to that, and all three to fourth convoy. Why is that bad? Well, you can only repair two sorties. If the computer does this, it's going to build up sorties we don't need to be building up because we could be spreading these out amongst the convoys and then repairing two sorties on all of them. So... What we're going to do is we are going to hover over here on this garrison unit and we are going to route it back to third convoy at Alexandria. There we go. And you can see we've now changed it to Alexandria third convoy and the other two are running through fourth convoy. So now we click... OK, so now we're at the Italian supply stage and let's first of all remove all of the no convoy operations. So now we see we've got five units that require some kind of supply, <coughs> but there's some sort of problem. What the computer is offering us is getting limited supply from Tripoli, which is the overseas factory just here. There we go. There's Tripoli, the overseas factory. Um, this is a useful trick, by the way. If you hold the shift key down while you're moving the map around, then all the units disappear. So you can see exactly what's underneath. Um, now, the Italians have some problems. Uh, so here's the solution that I would generally go for. You want to keep the Tobruk garrison fully supplied. That's the main priority. So you have to click on the actual unit. Then you have to swing back, click on Tripoli. That creates a supply line between those two locations. Then you've got various options and you want to use the convoy. We're going to need an escort here. So we assign the escort and then we press confirm escort and then we click here 
Now, what's happening is we're immediately being intercepted. This is the problem with the UK having air and naval assets in Malta. The Italians did, during the war, plan out a possible airborne assault on Malta, known as Operation Hercules. They even built a fully functioning airdrop uh, division, but they never actually implemented the task. I mean, the Italian war economy just didn't have the capacity for it. It is an option in the game. And if the UK take an extremely proactive decision in terms of putting troops into Malta, it's an option you might well want to consider. Now, what's going on here is that in order to successfully intercept, an enemy unit will first of all have to defeat the fleet. That will cost it a sortie. Then it will have to defeat the convoy, which will cost it an additional sortie. So Force H can go in first. We do have the submarine counter. This is potentially really useful. It applies a minus two to the British unit we're engaging with. Um, in this case, I wouldn't. Our Italian units are close to exhausted anyway, so it isn't going to make a large difference. Both sides get one sortie. That's the kind of result you're going to expect when all the sides involved are so exhausted. We commit the RAF fighter. And both sides get a sortie. So nobody gets through to the convoy. There. And we've supplied the unit at Tobruk. So the unit at Tobruk is at full strength. And it will be, be able to repair any step losses it takes. Now. You'll notice we have three garrison units. At Benghazi, al -Aguila, and at Tripoli. This is a really bad plan. This is more units than the Italians can easily supply. If we do that run again, we're going to get intercepted again. And this time something is going to get through to the convoy. So what we'll do is we'll assign supply from Tripoli. And then from Tripoli again. Uh, you're only supposed to be able to supply two units from the same overseas factory, so I'm assuming if I click this I will get an error message. Yes. Cannot supply more than two units. So what we'll do is we'll let the fifth take a no supply. Now, that has left all three of them in exactly the same situation. So all of those units are now on low supply. Next turn, when we do the same thing, we'll be able to limit its supply two of the units, and that will keep them on low supply, but we won't be able to supply the third unit, and that unit will drop to no supply. And when it drops to no supply, it will take a step loss because of the no supply status, which means we're going to lose the unit, unless we run our convoy in order to supply it. Now, we do have the battleship, and the battleship, are, is worth discussing. It's being offered the opportunity to limit supply from Tripoli, which we know it can't do. We could also, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to click on it and we ought to be able to click on Tripoli and then use the convoy at Tripoli. Uh, you can supply a battleship with a convoy, but you don't need to. Fleet elements can run their own supply, and it does not cost them a sortie. Now, here's a complicated question for the British. They can intercept that unit, but if they do so, right, they're using up a point they could be using for something else. So we're going to intercept it with Force H, because Force H is in the same position. It's going to be able to run its own supply. It can run its own supply even when it has six sorties. And then it can just repair the sorties. And this keeps the battleship as inactive as possible. Adds a sortie to both. We're not going to intercept with the fighters. Uh, 
there we are. So now it moves to the British turn. And what we do is quickly, while we're at it, we'll activate the UK RAF. And we will target the convoy in Tripoli with an airstrike. Which adds another sortie to that convoy. So this is the basic objective. Suppress the Italian supply to minimise the number of units that they can keep supplied over here. And therefore to maximise the potential for a successful attack. And this works both ways. When the Germans are attacking um, or the Italians are attacking, they're going to want to do the same thing. Uh, just to alert you to an important rule, Rhodes here is an Italian port. So you can base a fleet at Rhodes and it can go via sea zone 27 back to an Italian mainland section for its supply at Brindisi. Because this is a straight moving from sea zone 26 to sea zone 27, you can't intercept through it, which means that the UK can only intercept if they are running from the Mediterranean, running the Mediterranean fleet out of Alexandria. Uh, or, of course, if they've created the nightmare situation of getting a fleet into Malta. So, we're going to activate UK units. Our objective here is very simple, and it's about the way that forts work. Forts do not exert a zone of control, which means, as you can see, we can move the Western Desert Force completely around the fort. So there's two things we want to do. First of all, we want to move the Western Desert Force to here. Well, declare an assault, because we can. And the, this is not a supply trap. The Western Desert Force can trace two hexes, one, two, back to the road, and then back along the road to Alexandria. And it's perfectly okay to do so, because the unit in Tobruk is not exerting a zone of control. And that is true of all fortified units. They do not exert zones of control, and therefore you can just walk around them. Now, the Western Desert Force can't go any further. If it goes to 5338 or 5437, then it can no longer trace two hexes back to a line because you can't draw the line through Tobruk itself. So that is the limit of how far you can go around the fortress. But it is enough to cut off this space here and isolate the unit in the Tobruk fort. That has two effects. One, it will cut the Tobruk fort off from supply and two it will give a plus two bonus for any attack on the fort. It has a third tactical effect. It positions the Western Desert Force here where it can strike at Benghazi. Now Benghazi is also a port. If you take it you could in principle then rebase the Alexandria fleet to Benghazi to keep the Western Desert Force supplied. So this is the space here around Benghazi and Tobruk where any sweeping envelopment manoeuvres are going to happen. You'll notice it's the only point along the run of the coast where the front is more than two hexes wide and therefore the only place where you can technically sweep round a badly positioned enemy unit. Let's do an assault. So we've got a plus one for being UK France, plus two for isolation. We've got a minus one because it's a city. We're going to be putting two additional attackers in. That's an additional plus two. We can commit a tank. That's going to be another plus two. So we'll be running at plus six. The Italians 
might as well commit their tank. It's not like they have any other combat operations to commit it to. And we get a defender retreat. So let's look at all this. We get a plus six. We roll three. We get a nine. We're attacking forts. So that's rounded down. Ra so that's divided by two and rounded up. So the end combat result is five. The Axis player rolls a one, which means that we get a Defender Retreat. The Defender Retreat is the best result we can possibly get. It creates a step loss on the Tobruk Fort. Now, if the Tobruk Fort were out of supply, it would now be almost certain to fall on the next turn. We do another attack and any positive result would destroy it. However, the Tobruk Fort is still in supply. Let's pass. And we can see supply issues for the UK. Again, we can see the computer still doing this dumb thing where it allocates everything through the same convoy. Uh, we want to send two of the things back to second convoy because second convoy... We want to use second and third convoy. Fourth convoy has two sorties, so it can be f fully repaired. These two have no sorties and one sortie, so two convoy and one com and three convoy are the ones we want to be using. So let's send one back to three convoy, one back to two convoy, one back to two convoy, and now we can unlimited supply. The Mediterranean fleet can just unlimited supply itself. Force H. Can take its supply from the UK. It's an exhausted fleet element, so there's no point in intercepting it. But every single time you say that you don't want to intercept it, you need to re-establish the supply line. It's a very irritating bit of the interface. Uh, don't intercept. You can tick the box to say no more interceptions. I should have done that. There. So now it's down to the fighter. We want that fighter to be supplied. That fighter is fantastically useful. It's interfering with the Italian supply. So we use the convoy. Doesn't really matter which way we go. We're going to be intercepted one way or the other. Now here, we're having to go a long way for supply. So interdiction matters. If the unit is successfully interdicted, then it will fail its supply run and it will return to Malta and we won't have supply for the British fighter. And a convoy cannot continue doing supply runs after it hits six sorties. So let's hit it with the Italian... F we'll hit it with the aircraft. They've got the best chance of getting an interdiction. Only a plus one. So now we have to think, well, do we realistically have a chance of interdicting with a minus four fleet against a minus five convoy? So we know the convoy is going to be basically rolling a one. So the question becomes, can we get a three result? And the answer is no. Even if we roll a six, that fleet is only going to get a two. So it's only going to get a no effect. A no effect is not going to stop the convoy. So we should absolutely just let that one slip past. So again, we have to go and re-establish the supply route. Now, the Italian plane is on minus four, but it has a plus one bonus. So if it rolls a six, that will get it a three and it will have successfully intercepted. So it's almost certainly worth having a kick. See, it gets plus one air versus naval. That gives it a one in six chance of successfully intercepting the convoy. And it does. There you go. Rolled a six, which is
which is what it needed. It gets a DR plus two. The supply trace fails. And now we have no options left for the aircraft. We have to click no supply. Now the critically important part of that is all of the units that are on limited or no supply cannot take replacements. So you'll notice we are not being offered the opportunity. Oh, they're all garrisons down there. So here we are being offered the opportunity to replace on the Tobruk Fort. It's fine. Tobruk Fort is now operational again. We can replace on the Italian aircraft. Fine. Operational again. We can replace on the convoy. And that leaves us the ability to reconstruct one fleet. So my general rule of thumb is it's better to have a single very strong fleet than to have two relatively weak fleets. So it is better to put two sorties back onto an Italian fleet that had four rather than put two sorties onto an Italian fleet that had six and wasn't operational. So the British now get the opportunity and you'll notice what's missing. They do not have the opportunity to place replacements on their aircraft. So obviously they want Force H back up and running, but they do need to be worried about supply. You'll notice the supply status is racking up. First convoy, which is on the island, is out of... First convoy is our only way of re-establishing supply to the aircraft. I have to take a look at that supply interface again because I've just noticed two of our sorties went onto fourth convoy and we were trying to put them on second convoy. So let's give Force H and the first convoy. Now notice that means we've got nothing left to commit over here to our convoy units around the Suez Canal and we're burning three sorties off them every turn to fuel these. Hmm. But that's the situation. Play with the Italians again. Right, so we are now required to send a convoy to support um, Italian occupation, Italian activities in Albania. And this is one of the special events. Obviously, it's generally better to send whichever convoy has taken the most losses. So... Which is less than ideal because the convoy we would be sending is the one down here and we would then need to get a new convoy into position which is going to run substantial risk of interception. <coughs> no, we'll send this and we'll keep the convoy that's in Tripoli. Strategic movement with the Allies, no. Now, Here's one of the effects of being on low supply. It halves your movement, <coughs> which means we cannot move this unit up to protect the Tobruk Fort. OK, made a mistake there. <coughs> so now the Tobruk Fort is in genuine danger. We are going to struggle to supply it at the end of the turn. The only way to do so <coughs> would be to take our convoy out of Tripoli and deposit it into Tobruk, which I'm not going to risk. Uh, you can make a fight of Tobruk. It's a perfectly reasonable strategy. But on this occasion, I'm not going to do so. I'm going to simply flick through the Italian moves. So, it's my all new 
convoy. We can't supply to to Brook, so we're not going to click no supply there. We can supply the battleship. Click on it. <coughs> we can do limited supply for different units. I'm going to boost number four to full supply. Tracer supply line back to Tripoli. Use the convoy. Run the convoy to here. We have intercepting units in Force H. It's going to attempt to make an interception. Gets a DR plus two. Which intercepts the convoy and prevents the supply trace. But the convoy is still available. So we will try that again. So anytime you get a DR plus two, you're intercepting the convoy. <clears throat> this time we don't. Uh, we take limited supply for the other two units from Tripoli. But the Benghazi unit is now at full supply. It's now the Western turn. <clears throat> Fairly simple. We launch an attack on Tobruk. Fan attack. Fortunately, we get an attacker stopped result, so we have not succeeded in relieving, in taking Tobruk yet. <coughs> but there's plenty more turns. Anyway, <coughs> I'm not going to cover, I'm not going to go any further with the scenario. That's pretty much how the scenario runs for the whole thing. It's fundamentally a supply game. You've got to keep supply to your units. You've got to manage the supplies that you have. You have to take advantage of ebbs and flows in the enemy's supply and which units are arriving or leaving for other theatres. And you've got to use those to either, with the Allies, break through to Tripoli or, with the Axes, break through to Alexandria and Cairo. And seriously, playing this through will give you a really solid understanding of that. And the things to remember are you can intercept supply tracers and when you do, they don't succeed. But to achieve that, you broadly need relatively fresh units doing the intercept, preferably against relatively worn units doing the actual thing. Because a lot of naval combat just ends in both sides adding a sortie. An individual convoy can broadly manage two sorties a turn. The big issue in this particular scenario is that the British and the Italians only have about 12 production points each and that isn't enough to rebuild their fighters, move their units and re rebuild all of their convoys after their convoys have operated. If you are operating more than one unit on the front line you're having to give up some convoy production elsewhere. The other thing to note is that the weather in the sea zones changes around quite a lot. Generally speaking, it's much easier to make blockade running supply runs with the Italian fleet when the weather is bad because you're more likely to get a both sides just add one sortie 
rather than an intercept result. But there's a lot to this. There's all sorts of small fiddly rules. When you're transporting a unit, if somebody gets an intercept, it won't stop you if you're in the same C zone. So you can run units between Tripoli and Sicily, and the Allies cannot actually stop you from doing that. But they can stop you from running supply, unless you're a fleet element, in which case you can always get supply, though you might lose all of your sorties doing it. So, you know, the, the little details here, they still confuse me when I have a go at this. I'm sure that they will confuse you. I'm going to have to go back through the video and edit a couple of places where I'm pretty sure I made mistakes about the details of how the supply rules work. So, yeah. This one is all about rules. If you know the rules well, you are going to win this scenario, hands down, over an opponent who's only really got a general understanding of how the supply rules work in the invasion of France and the invasion of the USSR. The sea supply rules matter. They make this overseas operation in North Africa a complex logistical arrangement. And you need to get a good sense of them because when you play the main event, Africa can transform completely. There's a whole range of possible strategic situations in Africa. I've seen the Germans go for Africa before France. So literally you're fighting with the French and the British against a massive attempt with panzer armies to actually overwhelm North Africa. On the other end of this, you can have the Italians make a decision that their only objective is to slow the British down. That all they're doing is playing a defensive game. They're not going to suck away German units from other locations in order to support their Mediterranean ventures. Remember, if the Italians play a defensive game down here, that frees a motorised uh, army, Rommel's Africa Corps, to participate in the invasion of Russia. Potentially, if instead of fighting down here, the Italians send their staff east, they can spare two infantry units and a dedicated fighter support for their army in Russia. Two Italian infantry units and a fighter support, I would say, is pretty close right, to being adding two more German infantry to the general invasion. Um, and all they have to do to achieve that is basically accept that they're running a holding action in North Africa. So, have fun, and the next video I do will be on something else.